say, one of the great pleasures of the, the festival, in addition to having people read Wright's work, which is always interesting, each person brings a different perspective to the work, but then having people read their own work is an entirely different um, feeling at all, because people know how to make the poem work, and uh, they know what's coming. And I think you could see that in Maggie's poetry, too, that uh, each one of her poems sort of comes to life when she brings her own voice to it. And then, so Dave will read, and then after Dave reads, at 4.30, the screen will drop down, and it'll be nine foot wide, and then James, Mar then James Wright will rise from the dead at the <laughs> County College of Mars, and he'll be on for an hour. And so he's dead, so he won't mind if you get up and walk around. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you, the spirit is not vengeful. Just hold out for like 20 minutes. That's right. Um, okay, so Dave Lucas. Dave Lucas has the honor this year of being the Poet Laureate of Ohio. The other day I heard Tracy K. Smith, the Poet Laureate of the United States, referred to as PLOTUS, P-L-O-T-U-S, which would make Dave flu, P-L-O-O-H. <laughs> Dave's publishing record is prestigious. In addition to his volume, Weather, it's had poems in many of our most significant literary journals, including the American Poetry Review, Field, Paris Review of Poetry, the Virginia Poetry Review, Slate, and The Nation. Dave teaches at Case Western Reserve University. When you purchase his book, you will recognize why the editors of these journals wanted to offer his works. His poems are thoughtful and direct. You can grasp them quickly and contemplate them at leisure. Davis said that autumn begins in Martin's Ferry, provided him with a moment of epiphany, causing him to realize, I can write about where I'm from, about what I know. Thus we have his poems at the Cuyahoga Flats, the Hullet Oolotas, Midwestern Cities, and my favorite, River on Fire which reminds me of one of my favorite Randy Newman songs, Burn On. So obviously, you knew that, right? Um, content aside, one of the aspects of Day's poetry that I most appreciate is his ear. Clearly, he delights in language and is skilled in making his words sing, as in this passage from Every Vein and Switch to Liqueur. So the passage is, Come spring for summer, blush and simmer thrust, all beaconing to blossom, fulsome, lush. In those 14 words, notice the complex interplay of sounds, the sibilant S's, the plosive alliterative, B, alliterative B's, and the gliding rhythm that pairs thrust and lush. Let us welcome Dave Lucas. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, I should say right off the bat, for those of you who are expecting to hear poems from the Belmont County Sheriff. Um, please, accept, please accept my apologies. Uh, he has his world and I have mine, and um, we're, we're making do. Um, thanks to Tom so much for the invitation to be here um, in a place that means so much to me, um, with a chance to celebrate a poet who has meant so much to me as well. Um, it's an honor to share the stage with Stan and Maggie and Jonathan. Um, and with many of you today, too, many of you whom I met this morning and have, have heard read this afternoon. Um, and I'm especially grateful to be here with friends and family. Um, my father's side of the family, the Lucases, have been in Belmont County for over 200 years. Um, and I know that my father would have been thrilled uh, to know that I was reading poems so close to the ancestral home. So I'll read a couple of, uh, about him um, in a little bit, but I'm going to start with two poems that are relatively new, one of, one of which, in fact, I've never read before. Um, and these are, uh, I don't know what to make of these yet, so I'm hoping that, that a friendly audience will, um, will respond. That, that's, so you have to like them, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. Um, they're both very sort of sing-song, nursery rhyme sounding poems, but I'm hoping to get at some of the way that poems, those songs sound, um, and maybe, maybe add some darkness to them as well. Counting song. One is in danger. Two is a game. Three is to linger. Four is for home. Five is a fist. Six for stitches. Seven is ashes. And eight makes a feast. Nine is to save. Ten takes to march. Eleven is knives. Twelve is a church. Uh, and then this one is, is brand, brand new, um, and I'm a little bit terrified to read it because it's something of 
It's intentionally a tongue twister, but here we go. This is called Alas and Alack. <coughs> the lily fills the valley, the glitter gilds the gold. The till will tell the tally until the tale is told. The ghosts lost in the past, the less belies the loss. The fist must fasten fast the chris across the cross. Alas looks like alack, as kin's akin to kind. So back to back to back, go blind behind the blind. The meter meets the matter, the lines and lines align. But let the letters scatter, and may I mean all mine. We're in a tri-state area here, so I'm going to get in the names of some cities that, that and when you, you know, when you hear it, feel free to just sort of root for, root for yours entirely. Um, this is called Midwestern Cities. You Midwestern cities, you threadbare capitals, lost satellites, will your outskirts never end? Will your suburbs run each other through and your accents bleed into a slang of silk and husk? Dawn is slipping across the chain-smoking factories of Pittsburgh and Cleveland, where the third shift sleeps off its yingling, where pierogi boil and stanch. Wake, Detroit, the morning molts over Ten Mile. Rise, parched Indianapolis. Rise, great skyscraping Chicago. The odors of your millions soap the L. Cincinnati, St. Louis, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, your waters run on. Your congregations hymn. The billboards declare the second coming could come at any second. From anywhere, Akron or Grand Rapids. From Gary, Kenosha, Duluth. I have this very clear memory of being um, about five years old and being visiting my grandparents in Bethesda um, and my father and I plotting to go out very early in the morning, about two or three in the morning, to try to see Halley's Comet. Um, and, and as a, a child, I was fascinated by that prospect. Um, and as I grew older and realized I was going to have to wait a long we never saw it, by the way. Um, the viewing, viewing conditions were bad. And the bad news about a comet like that is that you've got to wait pretty much the span of a human lifetime to see it again. <laughs> But the fact that it's about the span of a human lifetime is, is just the perfect subject for a poet. And so um, this poem takes its title from um, a phrase that's in Latin on the Bayou Tapestry, which illustrates the victory of Henry II. Uh, I think I have my history right there. No? Some, no? William the Conqueror. William the Conqueror. Thank you. Harold. Thank you. Harold. That's right. It was Harold. Okay. That's in the notes here, but I don't check the notes very often. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so. Uh, the title is the, is the English translation. The Latin comes later on in the poem. I won't translate it in the poem because I'll translate it at the beginning. The poem is called They Wonder at the Star. Frost scored, ache early, hibernal small hours. My father lifts me awake, blankets and mittens me. The lake lay in its black glass sheet and shelf. My father's coffee seethes. He angles the telescope. Its metal cold cuffs my eye. Tunnel and void, the stars shiver against my trembling cheeks. Hours we wait. No star, no omen. Nothing in so much nothing. Dawn stirs like blood before a blush. Comet, your pale hawk and haze defied me then. Centurial phoenix, nebulous Dutchman. A father's father ago, this earth passed through the ice-bright cloud of your gaseous coma. Though I doubt they craned their necks from the fields, skyward, toward the sailor-blessed red of dusk. But I know your shape, saber star. You hang above the Damoclean English before Hastings, heralding the Gallic smoothing of the old, rough tongue. Isti mirant stella. But I am filled less with wonder than this thawing indignation. By your return, I will have buried my father. My life will arc toward its own end. 
Arrive again in the pre-dawn dark with your illustrious dust trail, millennia of ice. I will not rise from sleep for you. Come gloried in color. I will not be moved. I could have just read the poem and gotten the history right. I'd forgotten that I had put that, put that in there and actually gotten it correct, so that's useful. Um, I mentioned earlier that I was going to read a poem that ripped off um, a line from James Wright, and this is it. What I didn't mention then is that it also rips off a line from Walt Whitman. So this, this entire poem is a cheat. Um, but if you can't cheat, why write poetry, you know? What the talkers were talking. You know what they say about the body crying in its thorns. You've heard it said we do not deserve the world we have been given, the tendons and roots and milk of things. Or maybe no one's said this. Maybe you've never heard of the dust that falls and covers us with the sloughed flesh of the dead in some absurd blessing, if there even is an us. Maybe this all sounds like madness, and you sleep softly, though the ocean blasts beneath you, though the earth turns in the dark. Um, I also mentioned earlier that I've been working on poems uh, that deal more directly um, with myth um, and legend and uh, scripture and uh, pretty much anything that, that humankind has ever set to paper or whispered to each other and said was true somewhere. Um, and so um, I'm going to read some poems from that, from that manuscript. Um, the first of them imagines um, Cain in one version of the tradition after, after the incident with Abel, which frankly we only get the one side of, let's <laughs> say. Um, we, we find in one tradition that Cain wanders the earth forever, and that is his curse, to wander and wander. And so I imagined what that would be like if he had wandered into the 20th or 21st century. Um, and this poem places him in a place called Nod, which I imagine as being everywhere he goes. Evening in Nod. His day's work done and his third beer drained, Cain finally feels like himself. Buzzed in the static of late August when his friends go back to school. He always misses them more than he can say. He does not say much. Soon they will be old and he will need to wander on, labor earned by the sweat of his brow. For now they have set up the empties on the railroad trestle and are knocking them off with rocks one by one. Cain can throw better than any of them, but he lets his friends win. He loves them. He cannot believe how the summer has flown. He has never loved anyone so much. Uh, you may also remember the story of, of the household gods who are smuggled away. Um, and uh, that's probably all you need to know from this. A story from Genesis, the household gods, and that's the title of the poem. Um, I take it in a different direction, but that's where I start with it, the household gods. Forgive me. I have smuggled them away from my father's house to this sodden pitch in the middle of my life, their names asleep under my tongue. I have walked beneath the heavens of false faiths I have loved too much to leave behind, for which I will be punished. Forgive me, I have only words to pray with, only these idols to line the secret study of my heart. If there is a God, he is a jealous God, a desert God, and the mountain smokes when he is angry. For all I do not know, I know there is no psalm but the taste of salt, no altar other than the dark. Uh, for this one, you need to know that um, in the Aeneid, um, coincidentally, the title character of which is Aeneas. Come on, that was, that was a little bit funny, wasn't it? <laughs> Lynn, thank you. Thank you. Lynn laughed. Yeah, okay. Thank you. It's coincidental, isn't it? I'm trying to lighten you up because the poem is not a pleasant poem. 
Um, the, next, the next two are pretty rough. Uh, so Aeneas, Aeneas um, carries his father on his back out of Troy as Troy is burning. Um, and during the course of the journey from Troy to Rome, which Aeneas ends up founding in, in the legend, um, his father dies and uh, Aeneas falls in love and then, and then circumstances lead to Dido also dying. Um, and he encounters both of them in the underworld in book six of the Aeneid. Um, and when he sees his father there, he attempts to embrace him three times and three times the shade of his father passes through his hands. Um, so this poem is called, If Not Aeneas. I descended into the underworld again in my dream. And there for the umpteenth time stood my father in a plaid button-down shirt and khakis, a freshly lit pipe, a wreath of smoke around him, whiffs of aftershave. It was nothing like death. Or suppose I should say it was nothing like life with all its waste and junk, the cells rigged with their own end, flesh irradiated, dissected and stitched, Instead, he was himself, more himself maybe than he ever was in life. I wanted to speak to him and say, come back, come back. But my voice was drowning in itself. I knew he could not come with me, not without being changed. I must have known this even in my sleep, in our dreams, when we descend into ourselves and beyond ourselves. We who descend and return, too, have been changed. Aeneas returned to found Rome, although all he wanted was to hold his father again. I have founded nothing. I have found nothing. I am reaching out to grasp it in my arms. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, it's going to get a little heavier for another poem, and then, and then the next one, the next one's also heavy, but it's it's heavy with this sort of gallows humor. So then it will start to lighten, I promise. <laughs> but the next poem is called About Suffering. And um, coincidentally, that's also what it's about. <laughs> uh, but it's also, it's also about um, Icarus and Daedalus. And it occurred to me that, that poets really just have not done enough with Icarus. You know, it just really needs, we need more Icarus poems. Uh, no, I was sick of Icarus. Um, and so I wanted to write about, about Daedalus, who I think is a more... Um, interesting character in some ways. Um, Daedalus and Icarus are stranded on the island of Crete where Daedalus is employed basically as an engineer at very low pay. Um, he has to build labyrinths and do things like that, but in the meantime he has been fashioning wings out of feathers and wax. Um, and we, they decide to make their escape. Um, of course, Icarus is told not to fly too close to the water or too close to the sun. Um, he's a teenager and so we understand what happens. Um, but the more interesting part of the story for me was what happens after, um, and what happens to the figure of the father, um, and what brought him to the position where he is. So uh, the poem replies to Auden's great poem, um, Musée des Beaux-Arts. Um, that's, I think, all you need to know about it, other than the title, again, is about suffering. It's never Icarus. It's not that grand gesture of feather, wax, and atmosphere in flux. It's less than that. It's lesser than. It doesn't happen in pentameter. Suffering, failure, agonies in gardens. But in the sideways speak of bureaucrats whose words, like these, disguise what they intend. Under soft, fluorescent suns of waiting rooms, physicians' consultations, where the lungs on the light box are spread out like wings. All this illumination just to show the dark spots slowly blotting out our names. Sadder than tragedy and silly, these cuts that bleed you dry. I mean you. You know as well as I, Icarus is not for us. He flies and falls, that's all. He doesn't joke to hide his fear or seem ashamed or wound lovers with rusted, jagged-edged words. He never sulks in tristesse after sex. He's young and proud. He likes the sound of his own voice. Of course the world must break and scatter him among the falling birds. It's never him. His father, Daedalus, he's our muse, bent to an unforgiving craft in someone else's labyrinth, the dark exile in which he sets himself to work, letting the candles gutter so the wax spills, seals vein and down at quill and shaft, 
working longer into the thankless night. He has worked feathers into these wings for years. He has slim hope, at best, that they will hold. Come daybreak, they will stand outside the gate and test the wind. For once, he will be bold. At last, he sleeps in fits and half-dreamed fears that love and work and life are passing vapor. And all the wings he's made, he's made of paper. Um, oh, thank you. Poetry union regulations require me to um, notify you when there are two more poems remaining. <laughs> so let my supervisor know I came through. Um, what to say? Has anyone paid any attention to uh, the news in the last lost. 10 years? What happened? <laughs> and so this is an appropriate poem to that occasion. It's called Love Poem for an Apocalypse. There you go. <laughs> Love Poem for an Apocalypse. I wish I'd met you after everything had burned, after the markets crash and global sea levels rise, the forests scorched, the grasslands trespassed. My love, it is a whole life's work to disappear. Ask the god with his head in the wolf's mouth, or the serpent intent on swallowing all the earth. Ask the Senate subcommittee for market solutions for late capitalism and early onset dementia. You and a bird flu could make me believe in fate. I think we might be happy in the end, in the dark of a hollow tree, a seed bank or blast proof bunker. If only you would sing the song I love, you know the one about our precious eschatology, the one I always ask to hear to lull me back to sleep. Uh, and I will close with something just slightly more redemptive than that, <laughs> though it wouldn't take much. Um, this, this thing happened in Cleveland, um, and let me also say that it happened in a number of other industrial cities. But we took the blame for it, so you're welcome. This, one, this one's on us. Randy Newman, yeah. Uh, river on fire. Stranger, the way of the world is crooked, and anything can burn. Nothing impossible. Who comes to send fire upon the earth may find as much already kindled, may find his city bister and sulfurous, pitched and grimed. On those suffered banks we sat down and wept. There the prophets, if there had been prophets, would have baptized us in fire. Who says impossible they fill his mouth with ash, they quench him as if a man could be made steel. A crooked way the world wends, and the rivers, and the prophets. Go down and tell them what you have seen that the river burned and was not consumed. Thank you all very much. So again, I'd like to thank uh, you, the audience members, for coming and uh, participating in this, the, the Phoenix edition of the James Wright Festival. So I know that the Phoenix is supposed to rise and come back to life. And uh, so it's been gone 10 years. <laughs> if we came back in another 10 years, I'd be 80. And uh, I just said, <laughs> But I remember that when we had uh, Stanley Kunitz, he was 80, and I invited him in the, the fall, and I thought, will he be good till the spring, you know? For me to... <laughs> and so then he lived for another 12 years after that. Um, so I'm sure you'll all be around in 10 years, so maybe we'll do it in 10 years. Um, again, I very much want to thank Anthony and Elizabeth and the library staff for all of their jobs. When we drove up and we saw the banner, I was just flabbergasted. Yeah. Uh, it was totally unexpected, and then the nice touch of having the wood cut up there, too, just sort of brought everything to life. And then the, uh, the backdrop, we had a backdrop, but it sat out in the driveway for 10 years or so, and just sort of molded away. And Anthony constructed this oh. beauty, and 
So the virtue of that is that you're not distracted by books, etc., and then the stage. <laughs> so everything works very smoothly. And Elizabeth has been a pleasure to work with, too. Thank you very much. Um, Then our reference librarian, Donna Capizuto, was good that she left, so I'll have to speak ill of her. Um, <laughs> I shocked. Um, and so the high point of each year's festival has been Andy Wright's presentation. Andy Wright is really the, the sort of heart of the festival and really gives us legitimacy, raison d'etre. <laughs> and uh, my son, who's an atheist, said that she was a sainted individual. Uh, I believe that's true, even though my son said it. Uh, and you know, one of the impressive things about Annie is that, uh, as well as being, I thought that anecdote this afternoon that uh, what inspired her to become involved with James Wright was I placed to my life. I'm going to do something about that guy. Um, I feel as though she's been doing something for us too, just sort of keeping us on the straight and narrow. But in addition to her philanthropic activities. Uh, Annie has also been a tireless editor and uh, guardian of James Wright's work. Um, so Jonathan's work, doing the biography, um, you know, Annie saw to it that she found somebody who was good. Jonathan had to prove his medal before she gave him the contract. She made the right choice. Uh, and the biography is just a testimonial to Annie's work and Jonathan's work as well. Um, but in addition to all of that, when you consider what Andy has done, editing James Wright the collected prose, the delicacy and strength of lace, letters between Leslie Mob and Silco and James Wright, James Wright selected poems, a wild perfection, selected letters of James Wright, James Wright collected poems, you can see that she's worked very hard, very tirelessly, and worked well too. I mean, each one of those collections that Andy has, been, has put together, and Jonathan has helped him with on some of them, they're very well done. And they really stand as testimonial to his work. So James Wright died at an early age, and that could have been the end of it. I mean, he could have just been an important American poet who just has faded away, but he has not faded away as due to Annie's tireless, persistent, and gifted and skillful work. So we're very pleased to have him. Yeah. Oh! You can do it. Yes, I can. Without the sound effects, come on. <laughs> oh, <laughs> shucks, you're taking away my, you're taking away my fun. I feel like Galway Cannell helping <laughs> <laughs> the you know, Do we have to stand up there with you, too? <laughs> shut <laughs> up. <laughs> she told me to shut up. <laughs> there. <laughs> OK, thank you, guys. <laughs> Scram. <laughs> What? <laughs> I'm leaving you out of my will, Tom. <laughs> uh, okay. I am so happy. No, make that delighted to be back in Martin's Ferry in this esteemed library for another festival. The first time I came to Martin's Ferry was in May. 1982 to attend the second festival in honor of James Wright. Ted and Helen Wright, my in-laws, drove me here from Zanesville. Ted proceeded to show me some of the many Wright homesteads, views of the Ohio River and the library at the Shreve High football stadium and the old high school. Of course, since James and Ted's childhood, some of their homesteads were gone. There is an addition to the high school, which I understand is no longer, and a wide highway divides the town. I met the festival committee, headed by Tom Flynn, with John Stork, Mickey Riquet, and Kathleen Kink Lanatone, among others. Although the library where the festival was has been held was new since Jamestown time, I met Miss Annie Tanks, the former librarian, who told me that James spent hours there, often closed the place up, and sometimes wore boots covered with mud, proving he had recently walked by the river. I also met some of James' family, and for the first time, for the first time, including his Aunt Florence, who said 
she came to the festivals to learn more about her nephew. In the ensuing years, there have been many changes and some many losses. Some of the guest poets have died, as well as some committee members, including Mickey Reckay, who was a special friend. While other committee members have moved away and cannot be here today, but we are so happy David and Ridge uh, uh, Miles did come from Pittsburgh. Um, there, are, <coughs> there have also been losses among members of the Wright family, so it isn't true that the more things change, the more they stay the same. They change. On a lighter note, there surely has been a change which no one has mentioned. In the time of Me Too and multi-gender bathrooms, I think I would be completely welcome to join the guys at the bare-ass beach, <laughs> <laughs> with or without a bathing suit. <laughs> Now back to the present festival of 2018. The poets at my first festival were Galway Cannell and Stanley Plumley. What a wonderful coincidence that Stanley is here for this special festival, along with Maggie Anderson and Dave Lucas. It promises to be a wonderful festival, and it already has been mostly over now. Congratulations to the 2018 committee who have done such a splendid job. Congratulations to John Blunk for writing such a splendid biography. And congratulations to our lifetime festival chair chairman, the splendid Tom Flynn. I'm going to start not by reading anything by James Wright, but a poem by Gerald Stern. Now, talking about being 80 and maybe not being here at the festival, Gerald Stern is 92. And he would have been here, but he's in Florida, so he couldn't come. But he did write a poem for me to read at the festival. So after a drink of, it's not Ohio water anymore, gosh. It's called the beautiful. I never heard no, so I guess Jim Wright's ashes are scattered among the tea roses in Carlshire Park, a few steps from our apartment. And the East River was the beautiful Ohio in the last years he spent with Annie before his death. My river was Ohio too, but much more, uh, but more like it was the Mana Mana. How do you pronounce it? Yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> or some place between two rivers, that and the Allegheny, as they merged with the beautiful and went a distance north before it curved around west, then south through filthy Weirton and godforsaken Steubenville. <laughs> <laughs> On its way to the mother of rivers. He told me he used to listen to the pirate, Pirates games, so he knew the announcer, Rosie Rosewell. But I doubt if he ever heard Bishop Beck ask God to bless Rosie, as well as Mayor Scully and Councilman Walk and Eleanor Roosevelt, as he stood in front of his chorus of saints with their beautiful blue gowns and violins in the great church on Wiley Avenue, a block away from where I was born. Well, God bless Bishop Beck. God bless Jim Wright, too, who is not, I say not, in hell, for hell is Martin's Ferry, he said so himself, where he was baptized, and maybe bar mitzvahed as well, in some <laughs> absurd little synagogue, and his portion, as we say, was maybe John, the 15th chapter. No one has a greater love than to lay down his life for his friend. John, a Jew, like the others. God damn. <laughs> I'm going to report those claps for Jerry. <laughs> now I have a, my few words are interestingly enough, Stanley Plumley, to be about Fano, which you mentioned earlier, and I thought, oh, this is too many coincidences. I'm going to start by reading a favorite poem, a reply to Matthew Arnold on my fifth day in Fano, from this journey, and say a few words about the town of Fano. 
A reply to Matthew Arnold on my fifth day in Fano. And the epigraph is, in harmony with nature, restless fool, nature and man can never be fast friends. It is idle to speak of five mere days in Fano, or five long days, or five years. As I prepare to leave, I seem to have just arrived. To carefully split yet another infinitive, I seem to have been here forever or longer, longer than the sea's lifetime and the lifetime of all the creatures of the sea, than all the new churches among the hill pastures and all the old shells wandering around bodiless just off the clear shore. Briefly, in harmony with nature, before I die, I welcome the old curse. A restless fool and a fast friend to Spano, I have brought this wild chive flower down from a hill pasture. I offer it to the Adriatic. I am not about to claim that the sea does not care. It has its own way of receiving seeds, and today the sea may well have a flowering one, with a poppy to float above it and the Venetian navy underneath. Goodbye to the living place, and all I ask it to do is stay alive. And my uh, little talk is called A Fast Friend to Fano. James and I first visited Fano, a small town on the Adriatic Sea, in 1972. I had discovered the place while perusing an elegant cookbook by Samuel Chamberlain, filled with beautiful photographs of Italy, accompanied by recipes I could never attempt. I did take in the page about Fano, though, which included a shot of the Ark of Augustus, built in 2 AD. The beach and a little ancient history, what a combination. We had to go. We did, and loved it. Despite high season, we found a peaceful part of Fano, as well as a small, well-run Pensioni Astoria, owned by a genial middle-aged couple who catered to families, served good food, and provided us with a beach just a few yards away. We soon found a favorite cafe under linden trees and a little open market. We had picnics on the beach, took walks in the countryside, explored the town, and drifted along the quay after dinner. Seven years later, after an unpleasant experience in the city of Bari, we returned and were delighted to find Fano had not changed at all. We stayed at the same pensione, run by the same couple, and enjoyed a pleasant room with a sparkling white tiled bathroom. We especially liked our little balcony with a view of the sea, a sweeping stretch of beach, and several imposing headlands in the distance. We swam, walked for hours, and enjoyed the outdoor cafes, just as we had before, before, not to mention breakfast and dinner in a communal dining room where families chatted back and forth from their respected tables. We were delighted when the same little boy stood by our table every evening to gaze at James, who blew smoke rings for him. <laughs> Jonathan writes about that village as if he too had been with us. After our frightening experience in Harsh Bari, he felt we had, quote, ascribed healing properties, unquote, to Fano. He mentioned our long walks into the fields and farmlands among wildflowers, olive trees, and vineyards, but never quite reaching the steep headlands seen from the beach. The quiet of the town the green shade of linden trees in the piazzas, and the Adriatic breeze cast a spell. That's unquote Jonathan's words. For five days, we not only admired the sweep of beach and distant mysterious headlands, but actually stepped into that view. We seemed to have been there forever. Nine months later, James was in Mount Sinai Hospital diagnosed with cancer of the tongue. To keep up our spirits, we fantasized a trip to take once he had recovered. Unable to speak, James wrote down the dream itinerary on a yellow-lined pad, Fano, Verona, Sermione, and Paris. He also wrote the dedication for his new book, This Journey, to the city of Fano, where we got well, from Annie and me. 
Stefano being the place to which John had ascribed healing properties. 25 years later, in the summer of 2004, Jonathan, along with his wife Sarah, their daughter Emma, and I went to Fano. We arrived by car to discover so much traffic on one-way streets that I didn't recognize anything until we reached Pensioni Astoria. As we piled into the lobby with our luggage, I was reassured by the sight of a family wrapped in towels coming back from the beach. Something hadn't changed. However, it soon became evident things were very different. The lobby was now dwarfed by a new addition that consisted of a large room, most of which was encased in glass, furnished with couches of black and orange. A long bar by the glass wall was presided over by a man who glowered his welcome. It seemed that a nightclub of sorts named the Betty Boop Music <laughs> Bar was part of the old pensioni, now named Hotel Pen Astoria. A tired blonde woman of about 40 finally came to check us in. She gave us keys and pointed out the new to me elevator. Emma and I were assigned to my old room, now crowded by an oversized double bed, bunk beds, and a wardrobe without hangers. Only the little balcony and sunny white bathroom were the same. The next morning, completely confirmed that things indeed had changed. We came down to breakfast to find an empty room with no one in charge. Eventually, a waitress appeared and brought us coffee and stale slices of bread. Apparently, the hotel, Astoria, was no longer a family place where the owners took good care of their guests. Still, the blonde woman in charge tried to please us. She promised John and Sarah a new room away from the loud music of the Betty Boop bar, music bar and English breakfasts. Overnight, the weather had turned gray and cool, so instead of a swim, we took a walk, planning to trace the footsteps where James and I had once hiked. We went down the beach, crossed a little stream, ducked under the railroad trestle, and stopped short. Instead of a rustic track leading to fields, small clusters of trees, and the occasional farmhouse, we came to a wide highway jammed with speeding cars, utterly impossible to cross. On the other side stretched miles of cottages and gated villas instead of meadows. Only the sea and distant headlines remain, headlands remained the same. However, Four instances occurred during the visit, which gave cheer and restored my faith to the town. I had bought a copy of this journey, the book dedicated to Fano, and envisioned presenting it to the town's mayor. A woman at the tourist bureau was a great help. She called the town hall and set up an appointment so we could meet the mayor. We found the town hall, found the right office, and were greeted by the interpreter, a lovely young woman from Belgium. Then we met Sindaco, or mayor, Stefano Aguti, charming, handsome, and molto simpatico. <laughs> he and I shook hands. When I introduced him to Sarah, John, and Emma, there was more handshaking. The mayor seemed delighted with the book and <coughs> smiled broadly when the interpreter read him the dedication and showed him a reply to Matthew Arnold on my fifth day in Fano. We shook hands again, and he kissed me on both cheeks. I fluttered out into the main piazza, very happy that James' book was in Fano and safe in the mayor's hands. And I didn't wash my face that night. <laughs> but that night, encouraged by a description in Sarah's guidebook of a place, quote, like a pensione of 25 years ago, we tried it out. Once again, I was in a room where families were happily eating and talking at their own tables. We were served a simple but delicious meal by a cheerful waitress who brought us pasta, a large platter of meat and vegetables, salad, fresh fruit, mineral water, and a bottle of the house wine. In between courses, the people chatted to those at other tables, no doubt discussing their day. Now we understand what you meant by a pensione, said John and Sarah. Now we see how it must have been. On the morning we left, I handed my key to the blonde woman and told her that my husband and I had stayed there 25 years ago. 
She explained it was her parents who'd been the proprietors. Now she owned the hotel and her husband the music bar. Her eyes filled with tears as she told me her parents were dead. We shook hands, not letting go for a few minutes. Perhaps she too remembered a sweeter time. Then John had a surprise for me. Instead of heading toward the highway leading to Padua, he drove to the road we hadn't been able to cross. We went past many cottages as well as villa after villa. Finally, John turned onto a small road which eventually took us to the beautiful and peaceful countryside. Here were fields, a few farms, hill passages, and plowed rows of wheat, or olive orchards, and meadows of wildflowers that sloped down to the sea, just like the place of our long ago walks. Far, far beyond us stood the regal, indestructible headlands, a tribute to nature, and at that moment, a true friend to me. I've swiped Tom's tribute to James and introduction by giving my own. <laughs> and he'll forgive me. <laughs> yes. It's a pleasure to introduce you to Jonathan Blanc, the author of James Wright, A Life in Poetry. Three decades after James' death in 1980, the writer Leslie Marmon Silco gave a reading at the 92nd Street Y. She and James have met in 1975 and exchanged many wonderful letters. Jonathan, who was familiar with the letters, attended the reading and afterwards spoke to her about James. Leslie recalled James as one who had, quote, a warmth and kindness and humanity, a gentleness and love for the world and its beings, unquote. I feel John has captured those very qualities of which Leslie spoke in his splendid biography. To say I'm delighted with his book is an understatement. Since no one is perfect, not all of James' qualities were sterling, but John has beautifully captured James' humor, his intellect, his love of nature, gift for friendship, and total devotion to poetry. It is a great honor and pleasure to be speaking with him. Ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Blanc. What a great pleasure it is to be here and to, to look out at all of you. Um, someone asked me before um, what, what I imagined this to be like when the book was done. And I had to admit that it never occurred to me that this stage of the book, the actual f being finished part, had never occurred to me. I was, I, was, I was so deep in the book and so wrapped up in doing, um, doing a good job, you know, doing right by James Wright. Uh, I felt it as a real obligation. And, um, and so I've never imagined what it would be like to stand in front of people and actually read from the book. It's, I've, I've, been, I've been reading from the book um, since October when the book came out. And I've gotten better at it, but I'm still, I'm still, uh, uh, I'm still not used to it. I, had, I hadn't anticipated what, what, what this would be like, but it's a great joy to be particularly here in Martins Ferry where I spent so many wonderful festivals doing the research that made the book possible. Um, I think there's, I couldn't see any other way to do the book than to do the work that it took, the research, and, um, and so it's a great pleasure to share um, uh, just a piece of the book with you. Um, actually, at the last festival, I debuted what would become the first chapter of the book uh, in, in, in its draft form. And I'm going to read a short section from that same chapter as it is now published um, and, and share a couple of poems. This is not something that I, I generally have done at other um, locations. I've been reading other portions of the book, often geographically oriented when I was out in, at Kenyon and Oberlin and... Um, and then when I was out in the, on the West Coast at the University of Washington, uh, I was focusing on Theodore Retke. But, but here I would like to read 
just a, a, a short piece of that first chapter and, um, and a couple of James Wright poems because it seems to me that that's really the reason to have the book is to turn attention back to James Wright and, and to his work. That's really the whole point, uh, it seems to me. And um, I'm delighted to share this with you. The first chapter of the book I called, That is My Country, That River. And it begins with an epigraph from a letter that James wrote to Mary Oliver in September of 1965. My parents are sturdy, steadfast people, poorly educated, and especially my mother, very well read. My relatives are strangely unpredictable and rather wildly kind. Riverview Cemetery commands the crest of an Appalachian foothill where the Ohio River flows past Martin's Ferry, Ohio. Time and again, as a teenager in the early 1940s, James Wright climbed to this highest point above the river, anxious to feel the sense, the vista he found in books. But the smoke and soot from steel mills obscured the steep matching hills of West Virginia on the opposite shore. Behind him to the west, farmland, orchards, and fields had been disfigured by coal mine and strip mine. The river, too, was fouled by refuse and waste. Yet the Ohio defines the geography and the essence of the place. It is a boundary and a dark presence. The once thriving industrial town stretches along a narrow shelf half a mile wide, a hundred feet above the river's floodplain. In Wright's youth, this bottomland was crowded with factories, tenements, and docks, whole neighborhoods at risk of flooding each spring. He counted himself among the brief green things, the sumac, trillium, and weeds that survived in a ravaged place. By the time Wright left Martin's Ferry in June 1946, he knew every street and alleyway in his hometown, each muddy footpath that stretched for miles along the river. He knew the Ohio in all its moods. He knew what poverty was and hard work. When Wright enlisted in the Army at the age of 18, he swore he would never return to the Ohio Valley. He made only brief visits back home. His rage to escape the Ohio Valley remained a part of him, but the pull of memory would prove stronger still. Wright's childhood place came to occupy the center of his poetic imagination. Over the remaining 27 years of his life, he made it into an unmistakable landscape in American literature. Wright came to accept the peculiar kind of devotion he felt towards Martin's Ferry and its townspeople. I have done a great deal of wandering, he recalled late in his life, to Hawaii, to Japan, throughout Europe and the United States. Yet all of these places taken together do not have the vastness in my mind that I still find when I contemplate, as I have often done in my books, the small river town of Martin's Ferry in southeastern Ohio. Wright remembered with startling immediacy the dark howlings and twangs of language I grew up with, the nearly unspeakable violences of the spirit and body spun suddenly into Baroque figures of speech across the sooty alleys near the river and up and down the b &O railroad track that lay peaceful among the hobo jungles like a scar. Martin's Ferry was blighted in ways typical to industrial river towns throughout the early 20th century, its hillsides gouged by strip mines and air blackened by coal smoke, the river polluted by sewage and oil. But as with other towns that flourished in the Ohio Valley, the factories and mines attracted a great diversity of people. The headstones in Riverview Cemetery chronicle the history of Martin's Ferry's growth. The older ones on the lower edge bear the names of Welsh coal miners from the mid 1800s. Ascending the slope, the stones describe successive waves of immigrants from Hungary, Poland, Italy, Greece, Romania, England, and Ireland. In the childhood sketch he drafted in August 1978, Wright says of Martin's Ferry, 
I had lived in all of the neighborhoods, except the wealthy ones up on the hills away from the factories and the river, and I knew most of the languages, and carry with me today the affections of those words. Wright felt a sharp grief for those he left behind in Ohio. They are both the subject of and the intended audience for his poems. After years of rootlessness, he came to cherish the multicultural working class neighborhoods of his youth. And Wright's imagination always returned to the banks of the Ohio River. In form and body, it remains itself one of the magnificent rivers of the world. It could gather into itself the Seine, the Arno, and the Adige, and still have room for a whole mile of drifting, lost lives. In languages spoken by the native peoples of the Ohio Valley, many names translate the river as beautiful. The Ohio flows south and west for a thousand miles from the confluence of the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers, the site of Pittsburgh to Cairo, Illinois, where it joins the Mississippi. Various Algonquin tribes made their home in the valley and defended the land west of the river from local Iroquois and European pioneers. Beginning in 1744 and continuing for two decades, British and French troops battled for possession of the Ohio River and its surrounding territories. Native warriors prevented settlements west of the river until after the Revolutionary War, when thousands of colonists and more recent immigrants crossed the Allegheny and Appalachian mountain ranges to claim land for homesteading. Indigenous tribes were pushed farther inland, but the battle for control of the river was prolonged and bitter. In some native tongues, the Ohio then became known as the River of Blood. The first permanent settlement on the western shore across from the fortified military post at Wheeling, Virginia, sprang up around a ferry landing on a broad stretch of flatland. Absalon Martin had helped his father-in-law, Ebenezer Zane, survey the surrounding land. And Martin's ferry became the starting point of a good wagon road, as Zane called it, between Wheeling and Maysville, Kentucky. Zane's trace, a shorter and more reliable route west, less prone to the seasonal dangers of river travel, opened in 1797. For decades, the town of Martins Ferry remained a major crossroads and entry point to the Northwest Territory, what became the states of Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, and Wisconsin. The Zane family and other pioneers planted orchards of fruit trees, berry bushes, and grapevines on Wheeling Island and the open fields on the Western Shore, cultivating tracts they then sold to the steady waves of settlers. In childhood, Wright knew the legacy of those early farmers. Along the riverbank, amid tangles of shrub oak and sumac, the fragrances of blossoming pear, peach, and apple trees mingled with the smell of locust trees in the springtime. I'll leave that chapter there. And, and there's, there are two poems that I want to read for you that are very close together in, in spirit, um, and yet, it's, it's still a great surprise to me when I came across these drafts in his, in his work. This is maybe, um, well, this is three decades. This is September of 1976. Uh, James Wright had published, he was now married to his second wife, Annie. They were living in New York City. He was working at his desk near Carl Schurz Park on East 85th Street near the East River. But he had published a collection of, of prose pieces called Moments of the Italian Summer. And there was one poem that he felt ha he hadn't quite done what he had hoped to do, what he had tried to accomplish. And he struggled with revising um, this poem. After, this is a, you know, a full year after the poem had been published. And a much shorter version of this poem would appear in the last book he saw into print. It's called A Lament for the Martyrs. The version that I'm about to read is from the collection Moments of the Italian Summer.
I am sitting in an outdoor cafe across the street from the Coliseum. The noon is so brilliant that I have to wear my dark glasses. You would think a Roman noon could lay even the Colosseum wide open. But darknesses still foul the place and its hateful grandeur. The Roman Chamber of Commerce and Betelgeuse in Combine would gut the Colosseum by day or by night till the ghost of Mussolini and the ghost of God turned blue in the face and light wouldn't mean a thing in that darkness. Cities are times of day. Once Rome was noon. To take a slow walk, lazy with Quintus Horatius Flaccus at four o'clock in the night was to become light. If you don't believe me, I offer you a method of scientific verification. I lay you eight to five that you will go blind if you take a walk at high noon with the President of the United States. <laughs> I love my country for its light. I love Rome because Horace lived there. I am afraid of the dark. I am game to live with intelligent sinners. Sometimes these days the Romans say that whatever the barbarians left behind was later sacked and raped by the Barberinis, the noble family who needed the remnant marble for their country palaces. I find them fair enough for me. When I was a boy, the mayors of five towns in the Ohio River Valley solved the practical problems of prohibition by picking the purest and most perfect bootlegger between Pittsburgh and Cincinnati to become the chairman of the Committee for Liquor Control. <laughs> I think it would be wicked for me to wonder what the five mayors did with their cut in private. All I know is that within a year after Milber's public appointment to a legal office, a symphony orchestra mysteriously appeared in one town. Two spacious football stadiums appeared in two other towns. The madam of the cat house in Wheeling was appointed a dollar a day man by the federal government. And I lost an essay contest whose subject was the life and work of William Dean Howells, an American author who was born in Martins Ferry, Ohio, for Christ's sake, and whose books I had never even heard of, much less read. As I look back over the shadow of the years, I confess that I have read two of his novels, but I like him. He was a good friend of Mark Twain. But right now, the Roman noon is so brilliant that it hurts my eyes. I sip my cappuccino at a wobbly sidewalk table and ponder the antiquities of my childhood, the beautiful river, that black ditch of horror, and the streetcars. Where have they gone now with their wicker seats that seem to rattle behind the dull headlights in the slow dusk in summer where everything in Ohio ran down and yet never quite stopped. Now the Romans and the discovered Americans stroll blinded in the Colosseum, deaf to the shadows the place never loses, even at noon in Rome that was for a little while one of the few noons. Some archeologist gouged out the smooth dust floor of the Colosseum to make it clean. The floor now is a careful revelation. It is an intricate and intelligent series of ditches, and the sun cannot reach them. They are the shadows of starved people who did not even want to die. They were not even Jews. There is no way to get rid of the shadows of human beings who could find God only in that last welcome of the creation, the maws of tortured animals. Is that last, best, surest way to heaven, the throat of the hungry? If it is, God is very beautiful, if not very bright. Who are the hungry? What color is a hungry shadow? Even the noon sunlight in the Colosseum is the golden shadow of a starved lion, the most beautiful of God's creatures, except maybe horses. James Wright was unsatisfied with that poem. To my mind, the shortened version that appears in To a Blossoming Pear Tree falls short of the ambition in that piece. But in September of 1976, he turned to re revising that piece. I think I mentioned before that for him, revision was not about 
going back to a printed page and working to try to find a way through it. It was about reimagining, revision in its purest sense, re revising the piece. And as, of, as he often did when he revised his work, Wright began again from scratch, and the piece moves in a wholly new direction. He begins sitting comfortably here in Rome, sipping my cool mineral water that consoles me and allows me to feel at home with the summer heat. I can see something sinister in the light of those big stones. I can feel again a special horror I felt long ago the first time I learned that the word Ohio was an Indian word that meant beautiful river. Wright fills an entire page of his journal. It was my place. I was born there. Remembering his parents, Wright realizes they had given him and his siblings the best that they could, the plain truth. I think they wanted us to live our lives and see the sunlight and understand what it was. It fell on the only waterfall we all of us had. The sewer main poured down. It was our own bodies it poured down. Where has mine gone? Down river somewhere. As in so many of Wright's poems, the speaker stands on the banks of a river. Martin's Ferry's waterfall is not the shimmering polyphonic cascade of William Carlos Williams's Passaic River in Patterson, but simply the only waterfall we all of us had. Wright is again just one of the townspeople in Martin's Ferry. This prose passage in Wright's journal becomes marked with slashes to denote line breaks to the poem which became Beautiful Ohio, the concluding poem to his book, To a Blossoming Pear Tree. Beautiful Ohio, those old Winnebago men knew what they were singing. All summer long and all alone, I had found a way to sit on a railroad tie above the sewer main. It spilled a shining waterfall out of a pipe. Somebody had gouged through the slanted earth, 16,500 more or less people in Martin's Ferry, my home, my native country quickened the river with the speed of light, and the light caught there the solid speed of their lives in the instant of that waterfall. I know what we call it most of the time, but I have my own song for it, and sometimes, even today, I call it beauty. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad he returned in 1990 and 1999. Clever native of Bonsville, Ohio, which is just 30 miles to the west of here, has had a distinguished career. His early collection in the Adidas on the Delaware Schwaz, Schwaz Memorial Prize Award and Out of the Body Travel was nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Old Hot won the LA Times Book Prize was a finalist for the National Book Award. But I value in Stanley's poetry is its thoughtfulness which demands and rewards close reading, as in Dutch Ellen, the first poem in his latest volume. The poem begins by noting the disappearance of the Elms from Ohio and America, and then reflects on what passed with them. And the passage is, I miss even not standing there, and I miss 
a life of nothing but such moments, as if they never happened. And all you had to go on was their memory, and the feeling in the memory forgotten, but brought back again and again, because you missed someone you loved forever. The way the lines draw you into the abstract contemplation of absence, miss a life of nothing, they never happened, the memory forgotten, and then brings you up shot with the real and present, because you missed someone you loved forever. Earlier, Stanley mentioned that he liked the way he writes poems end. So in that poem, I've got these abstract thoughts going, and then all of a sudden it becomes the very real person that you loved. Um, it, that caught me by surprise and forced me to return and revisit the poem and reread it again, and it rewards you as you do do that. Reader Dove has observed, Plumley is the successor to James Wright and John Keats with a marvelous view of contemplation. And if you know Stanley's literary and critical work, that's a wonderful blending and marriage of the two, and we're very proud to have Stanley Plumley read for us. Thank you. I hope I don't need help. <laughs> I'll be all right. I am almost 80, so let's not hear more about that. <laughs> I'm going to read uh, two poems at having to do with the festival that uh, those first two times I was here. Um, first being a prose poem, uh, in, when Galway and I appeared together. Uh, and then uh, a poem from the um, <coughs> anniversary special. <coughs> Allergies are not good at this time, even as cold as it's been, they exist. This uh, <coughs> originally enough is called the James Wright Annual Festival. <clears throat> that night, we flew into Pittsburgh, where Tom Flynn met the plane to drive us back to Ohio, just over the river, into Belmont County, where we were to meet Galway and the hosts of the second annual James Wright Festival for supper and the chatter of a late night before the first day of readings. What I remember from the long ride in from the airport, a new spring night with constellations broken and the blurred edges of the foothills building against the wind in a wall up from the river is the dark and how it came into the car at a speed we understood, how it filled in the small lights going out everywhere behind us how it moved on our faces. How later after dinner, all of us tiring, it touched all our faces. What I remember from Galway's face that night is how the next day he talked about the work up until the end on the last book, or didn't talk but got lost in the moment of the last poem of that Vince morning many times since, and how he waited there and thought with the many sources. On the Sunday, I spent the empty early morning wandering too, lost in Martin's Ferry, where down the street from the library, the Heslop brothers were still in business, and farther still the WPA swimming pool project plaque shone like a war memorial object. And I walked down to the water, the beautiful Ohio depression wide all the way to Wheeling, and saw that whatever the working terrors are, they are worse over there. On the other side, laid off Sabbath or dead time on the line, <clears throat> where hell is still a foundry and a glassworks in an ice house filled with coal where they take you out of pity in the morning before daylight and bring you back in the evening, fire in the sun, white of the eye 
of the moon, and that even the petty farmers, our fathers, had come down from the farms to cross. James Wright Galway would finally say, had gone to the end of the table, which we will earn as we earn the daily bread set before us. And in Galway's face, in the room of the gathered that day, you could see the winter daybreak poem take form in a whole of the country, in high gold Mediterranean air, but lifted here like stone or lumber flat above the river. <clears throat> Things get to you sometimes. The other poem is um, kind of tricky. It, it has a lot of background. I'm not going to waste our time filling that uh, expository information in, except to say there was a, a helper young man who um, uh, sort of was guiding people around uh, this little town and uh, helping with whatever they needed uh, in the way of amenities. Um, <clears throat> it was a Saturday evening, beautiful sun, sunset. Uh, Peter Stitt was here. And he and I took a walk. And we ended up at the statue of Elizabeth Zane and at the cemetery, which uh, seemed to be a Civil War cemetery. There were like two wars being memorialized there. Her, she was uh, revolutionary period, and then the white crosses of the Civil War, which puzzled us a little bit. And this young man comes along and explains it all to us. Uh, he was very excited and exaggerated a few things. <laughs> The other thing was he had this tremendous scar from here to here. So you listened uh, more attentively. Ironically, this poem is about Stanley Kunitz uh, as the uh, senior member of that uh, uh, anniversary group. It's called uh, Reading with the Poets. There are other poets uh, who come up in the text which you'll, whom you will recognize. Whitman, for example. Uh, Whitman, among the wounded at the bedside, kissing the blood off boys' faces, sometimes stilled faces, writing their letters, writing the letters home, saying sometimes the white prayers, helping sometimes with the bodies, or holding the bodies down. The boy with the scar that cuts through his speech, who's followed us here, to the Elizabeth Zane Memorial and Cemetery, wants to speak nevertheless on the Civil War's stone-scarred rows of dead and the battle here just outside of Wheeling, equal in death to Gettysburg because no doctor between the war and Pittsburgh was possible. Boys dressed like men and men with gangrene first before the shock of the saw and scalpel three days between this part of the Ohio River and Pittsburgh. He knows. He is here since then a child of history and knows Elizabeth Zane saved all she could. Keats, all his wounded life, wanted to be a healer, which he was, once at his mother's bedside, failed, once at his brother's, failed. Whitman, Whitman in Washington, failed. How many nights on the watch and it broke him, all those broken boys, all those bodies blessed into the abyss. Now the poem for Lincoln, now the boy with the scar almost singing, now the oldest surviving poet of the war reading one good line, then another, then the song of the hermit thrush from the ground cover. Lincoln's long, black, brooding body sailed in a train, a train at the speed of the wind, blossoming, filling, and unfilling the trees, a man's slow running. Whitman had nowhere to go, so I leave thee lilac with heart-shaped leaves, he says at last. 
and went to the other side with the corpses, myriads of them, soldiers, white skeletons, far enough into the heart of the flower that none of them suffered, none of them grieved, though the living had built whole cities around them. Keats at his medical lectures drew flowers, not from indifference, not from his elegance. His interest couldn't bear the remarkable screams of the demonstrations. He sat there, still a boy, already broken, looking into the living body, listening to the arias of the spirit climbing. So the boy at the graves of the Union singing, saying his vision, seeing the bodies broken into the ground. Now the poem for Lincoln, now the oldest surviving poet, still alive, weaving with the audience that gossamer, that thread of the thing we find in the voice again. Now in the night, our faces kissed by the healer. Kunitz, by the way, is the oldest surviving poet still alive at that moment. Uh, A couple of people have asked for poems. I'm always hesitant because I have a plan and then uh, the plan goes to hell. Uh, <laughs> so let's see how that goes. Uh, but I do have a, a, a poem for Cunitz that uh, I like uh, from uh, uh, my time that I knew him when I lived in New York. Uh, mm. As you may know, he um, was uh, hmm. he was a um, great grower of roses, and he had a place out. Uh, in near Provincetown that uh, was uh, his favorite place to retreat to. Uh, little known though, however, was that his uh, place in the village on 12th Street had a garden in the back where he also cultivated roses. And uh, I uh, was privileged enough to spend some time uh, drinking a little white wine with him out there uh, on Sundays. Um, we were doing a thing one time walking from his place to NYU to inaugurate what became the Poetics Institute at NYU. Uh, and we were, I don't know why he got into this uh, deep melancholy uh, about his career. Now at this time, this is before we were in Ohio, so he was still in his young 70s. You know, he lived to be 105. Um, and he said the most remarkable thing to me, and it terrified me ever since. He said, you know, Stanley, th there, were, uh, there was a decade when I never knew another poet, never talked to another poet. <sighs> That's loneliness. Mm. Anyway, this is Kunitz tending roses. Naturally, he doesn't hear too well. So that when he's kneeling, he's really listening at the very mouth of the flower. And the feeling in his hands, his sense of touch, seems gloved, if not quite gone. Though when he bleeds, he takes a certain notice, wipes it away, and then moves on. And winter eyes. The old have passions, winter eyes, which see the pointillist chill clarity, but must look close, as his do, petal by petal, since the work is tactile, visual, cadenza, blaze, red fountain climbing, or like freestanding rhododendron, sunset gold medallion, scarlet maiden. 
His body bends depending on the height and cluster or on a perfect scale, the stature of the rose, which like the day declines continually, meaning that toward evening, he almost disappears among the fragrance, gala, and double flesh of roses. Or when he's upright, back to the sun is thin enough to see through, thorn and bone. Still, there he is on any given day, talking to ramblers, floribundas, Victorian perpetuals, as if for beauty and to make us glad, or otherwise for envy and to make us wish for more, if only to mystify and move us, the damasked, dusky, hundred-petaled heart. Interrogate the rose, ask the old, who have the seminal patience of flowers, which question nothing less for why we ask, enchanter, ember, blood talisman, something to summarize the color of desire, aureate, or red passion, something on fire to hold in the hand, the hand torn with caring. Jonathan asked me to read a poem that is tangentially right uh, contextualized. <laughs> it takes place in Italy. If you think of Sicily as Italy, do we think of Sicily as Of course we do. The Sicilian uh, people think they're the first Italians, and maybe the only Italians, uh, if you spend any time there. Um, they are quite wonderful. There's a village on the western coast where the tourists don't go, uh, just uh, somewhat south of uh, Palermo, called uh, Erice, uh, E-R-I-C-E. It's about tw it's a medieval village. It's 2,500 feet up. So that uh, when I was there, uh, you open the balcony and it's not fog. It's a cloud that comes in in the morning to greet you. It's just fantastic. And right down there uh, is the Mediterranean. Um, from that balcony, I uh, uh, in the afternoon when I was about to take my nap, there would be uh, the uh, this pack of dogs taking a nap. Uh, Italy is full of wild dogs. Uh, uh, and uh, this group was very, very calm and very uh, polite, if you will, uh, around town. You'd see them all the time. But uh, they were always taking naps under my, I was on the third story, uh, always taking naps um, under my balcony. So I felt I had to, I guess, respond. You can't get dogs and Italy into the same poem without dealing with certain archetypes, which I think you already are aware of. Uh, they're in here too. I'm sorry, I indulged the cliche, but uh, couldn't help myself. Anyway, um, uh, Erice is completely marble. Everything is marble. All the buildings, all the cobblestones. Uh, the quarries are very, very close. Um, the other thing is, in the winter, when the tourists leave, there are only 200 residents, but there are 30 churches there. <laughs> uh, in Italian, which is a joke for me to pronounce, but uh, La Matania di Signore uh, is what the uh, place is sometimes referred to. The sleeping dogs, you got that already, okay. The sleeping dogs of Erice. At half a mile, the 30 marble churches and cobbled marble streets feel light as air above the sky blue depths of the Turanian, feel able, in fact, to float as on the platform of a mountain of a cloud, the Matania del Signore, though the plural would make more common sense since the gods of the many mountains around the Mediterranean have each had their day conquering the history 
of the island, arriving in a morning fog from sea on a schedule fit for war. <coughs> Italy's been, or, uh, Sicily's been conquered again and again and again. Right now, first light, the night ghosts of the air have risen off the sea or fallen from the sky or both at once. It doesn't matter. From this balcony, it's as if we have ascended into life in a wholly different way, purer in the purity of a velo venere. It will take all morning for the mist to disappear, especially from the slick stones of medieval village paths that still pass for streets and the shining stained glass windows so bright they'll stop the sunlight until the afternoon. Which is when I see them first, curled up for naps in an awkward weedy courtyard, four stories down, spaced as if assigned, six of them at least, though their numbers tend to change depending on the day and where they trail, usually at the edges of the town, which is when I see them running, sometimes chasing, sometimes playing, but always together, but not always, because the large dog lying or sleeping in the traffic of the Piazza Umberto is, I'm sure at heart, one of them. Lean the way these hunters are living off the land, the kind when I was a kid in the country of Ohio we called strays, dogs who'd been let out from the backs of trucks or cars to die or survive, burned with sores and starving. These, though, are Italians, Sicilians, who understand the value of community and numbers, the civilizing forces of the pack, so that when I see them now at different times, at different intermissions, nuzzling or mating, I'd swear they are eternal of the mythic body back to the nursing loving founding of old Rome, mist turned into stone and stone turned inevitably to ruin back into mist as they too are quarried, cut to shape, interchangeable through time and for a while the drained blood lilac color of white marble. This is another request, but uh, maybe more relevant for, for, uh, for James. Um, if I'm thinking right, remembering right, his favorite two poets were uh, Edward Thomas and uh, all our favorite poet, uh, John Keats. Uh, it's hard for Keats not to be your favorite poet. So that wasn't true for a long time, almost a century. Um, I suppose there's some, is there a doubter out there still? Uh, he, he needs to be arrested or she needs to be arrested uh, for his, own, his or her own sake, you know. <laughs> Have you ever been to Hempstead? Which is, which is now considered part of central London, it used to be. Uh, and it's still, it was uh, in Keats's time referred to as the lungs of London and people who lived down in the central part of the city had houses up, up there, uh, summer houses. Um, one of whom was Constable, the, the great uh, English landscapist, uh, John Constable, whose wife is not doing well, so in the summer they go out there to see if she can, she has TB, uh, not unlike uh, the poet we just referred to. Um, to see if she can improve. Um, and what the constable is doing in those summers is for various reasons, uh, because maybe the landscape around uh, the village is not that interesting. He looks at the sky. He says the emotion in a painting is in the sky. So what does he paint? Clouds. In fact, he paints nothing but clouds for two whole summers. 
Uh, nothing else is in the picture but clouds. He's very meteorological about it. He puts the time of the day and the, way, uh, the speed of the wind and all kinds of other notoriety relating to the weather uh, on the back um, of these paintings, which are done in oils. But he paints them on paper. That's got to be a metaphor for something. It's, since clouds are so ephemeral, it's as if he's imitating their nature. Uh, 50 of them survived. He did over 100 of them. Uh, if you go to, uh, uh, especially in the Tate, uh, spending time at the Tate, you'll see a, a handful of these uh, clouds. They're quite wonderful. Uh, and they're quite various, obviously, because the sky, it's an island. It's always changing. Um, so I had this fantasy. Keats is in Hampstead working on the, the odes, spring odes. There's Constable painting clouds. They never meet. How is that possible? It's not as if Hampstead is a large place. At least there's no record of them ever having met. Constable's clouds are for his wife, who's dying, but I stretch the point. This is a poem called Constable's Clouds for Keats. They come in off the sea, peaceable masters, and hold the sea in the sky as long as they can. And you write them down in oils because of their brilliance and to remember in its turn each one. It's 1822 after the Regency, and it would be right in the year after his death to think of these domed above the heath in their isolated chronicle as elegies of the spirit. Right to see these forms as melancholy hosts even at this distance. Yet dead Keats is amorphous, a shapelessness, reforming in the ground, and no one you know enough to remember. He lies in the artist's paradise in Rome, among the pagan souls of sheep at pasture. You'll lie in Hampstead, where he should have stayed, to meet you on your walks of Lower Terrace or along the crowning high street heading home. Your clouds grow whiter, darker, more abstract from one elaborate study to the next. Correlatives are close to the real sentiment that lives, you say, in clouds, subjects to counterweigh the airy gravity of trees and leaping horses. Keats could have met you. You must have seen him once against the light, at least. He could be crossing on Christchurch Hill Road now, then over to the Elm Row and down Old Admiral's Walk. He could be looking at the clouds blooming between buildings, watching the phantoms levitating stone. He was there your first heath summer writing odes, feeling the weather change from warm to chill, focused no less than you on daylight's last detail, wondering what our feelings are without us. Mm. Mm. This is a poem for Jim Wright. It was in a book called Orphan Hours. Um, lapsed meadows. A lapsed meadow is, there's a lot of lapsing around here. <laughs> you may have noticed. Mm. Wild has its skills. The apple grew so close to the ground, it seemed the tree was thicket, crab, and root, and by fall would look like brush among the burdock 
and the hawkweed, as if at heart it had been cut and piled for burning. Along the edges at the corners like failed fence, the hawthorns, by comparison, seemed planted. Everywhere else there was broom grass, timothy, and wood fern, and sometimes a sapling, sometimes a run of hazel, sometimes depending, fruit still green or grounded and rotting underfoot. I remember in Ohio fields of wastes of nature, lost pasture, fallow clearings, buckwheat and fireweed and broken sparrow nests, especially in the summer in the fading hilltop sun, when you could lose yourself by simply lying down. Who will find you? Who will call you home now at dusk with the dry tips of the goldenrod, confused with a little wind filling in what's left of the light? Uh, and I want to end with that poem that uh, uh, Tom was kind enough to mention, um, Dutch Elm. I guess some of us are too young to remember elms. I mean, elms, elms were the trees that uh, created avenues and well, they uh, created cathedrals. Uh, a cathedral is an imitation of two great elm trees meeting over a street. Mm. I miss the elms, their crowns of airy dreams, as Virgil calls them. Their towering cathedral branchings spread into a ceiling above the lonely sidewalks of Ohio where the first elm deaths were reported in America. I miss in particular the perspective looking down the distances of all those elm named streets disappearing into dusk, the last sun turned the stained blue of church windows. I miss standing there letting the welcome dark make me invisible. I miss the birds starting to sleep, their talking in their songs, becoming silent, then their silence. I even miss not standing there, and I miss a life of nothing but such moments as if they'd never happened, and all you had to go on was their memory, and the feeling in the memory, forgotten, but brought back again and again because you miss someone you loved forever. Thank you.